Municipal governments are local elected authorities. They include cities, towns, villages, and municipal districts. In the political trenches, local government at work, we dive into the top issues facing local governments across Canada. My name is Christopher Brown, host of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown, and I'm joined by my co-host, Ian McCormick, president of Strategic Steps Incorporated. Today, we bring you the letter E for the environment. Later in the episode, we'll be speaking with the chair of the Green Municipal Fund Council, Mayor Alan D'Souza. But first, we are going to be discussing housing in Canada, a mayor in Ontario under scrutiny for saying that the new chief financial officer should be local and not from another province, and some updates on some of our past stories that we've talked about. So, Ian, how are you? Good to see you again, Chris. This- it's going to be fun. It's been a busy two weeks out in the municipal realm here in Canada. It certainly has. It seems like the last two weeks have flown by, but there's been just story after story after story. It seems like things are going on. But let's yeah. start with the big one, because this is an issue that is not only affecting the story that we're going to talk about, but it's affecting municipalities across this great country. In Ontario, there's been a lot of talk about the increase of housing in communities. Premier Doug Ford is looking at municipalities to help build over 1.5 million housing in Ontario over the next 10 years. The proposal, though, has has some mayors in Ontario up in arms as it will eliminate some development fees. Ian, how can municipalities begin to tackle the issue of housings in their communities? Obviously, communities are a place where people live, where they work, a um, place they call home and they play baseball and go swimming and all the rest of that. So they need a place to live as well. So that certainly makes sense to me. But as you start looking, particularly in places like southern Ontario or the lower mainland, where housing costs have put single family detached dwellings pretty much out of reach, other orders of government have started to come in and try and have some sort of an impact on, on market forces. You saw that in in BC not that long ago with an additional tax or something to that effect on uh, speculation properties people owned offshore. You're seeing that too in other provinces. You mentioned Ontario, for example. This might even be wrapped up in some of that conversation about the change in powers for municipalities or mayors in particular by the Ford government. But really, housing is a complex issue. It's not just a case of build it and they will come. In many cases, they're already there and they're looking for a place to live. And there's, I mean, you probably know there's a continuum of housing that runs all the way from transitional housing all the way to home ownership. Not that anybody wants to, everybody wants to go that far. And not that every community has to have the entire continuum represented. But if you look at this and you talked about the federal government being involved and the provincial government being involved and the local governments being involved too, it does become a social issue and it doesn't stand alone. So trying to fix this problem by just putting new houses up or new apartments up isn't going to solve the, in the, the problem in the long run, if you like. We've got that spectrum in place. We have other issues, too, at play with, are there jobs available for the people? Are there too many jobs? Uh, affordability, which we've already referenced. The social issues that go with housing, hostlessness, homelessness, uh, those sorts of things, and all sorts of social issues that get tied into housing, too. We also see things like people aging in place. There are people who are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s who choose to stay in their own homes for very legitimate reasons in a lot of cases. And for provincial governments or for those who are providing other types of health, then it's cheaper in many ways for home care to be used than to put somebody in some sort of a facility that maybe they they don't really want to go either. And then you can throw in their federal and provincial policy too. But ultimately, people live in communities and that's the local responsibility. So putting that housing stock in place ultimately ends up in the lap of the of the local governments, wherever that happens to be, Ontario in this case, but everywhere else, but elsewhere in the country as well. Can't hear you, Chris. Let's try that again. <laughs> In past episodes, we've talked about downloading of municipal, uh, provincial issues onto municipalities like social issues. Housing falls into this social issue that we've talked about in the past. Um, are municipalities becoming the one-stop shop for all issues that people are facing in today's world? Because we are seeing federal governments, and we're going to be talking with the uh, chair of the Green Municipal Fund Council later on about uh, climate change and his thoughts on that. But housing is one of these issues, while it's not a 
municipal issue. It's where people live. It's in municipalities, right? That's obviously true. Downloading works a whole lot better than uploading does. That uh, municipal orders, the municipal order of government is created by the various provinces and territories. They set the rules. So whatever wants to be passed down from the province, if they don't want to deal with something for a particular reason, goes to the municipality. If they think it's more appropriate, they can pass it on to the municipality. Or for politically expedient reasons, they can pass it on to the municipality. Housing, of course, being one of those. Where a lot of the social issues, even though not necessarily caused by local government or its policies and programs, must be dealt with by local go local governments. We've talked about things like tent cities in previous episodes as well. And that's, of course, uh, reminiscent of the housing crisis in this country, too. So this next story is quite a unique story because it, it, it it's based in Ontario, but it has a local Alberta angle as well. The mayor of Sudbury, Ontario, has rescinded an offer to their new CFO, chief financial officer, who lives in Alberta, as her circumstances could not allow her for her, the move from Alberta to Ontario. The mayor is quoted in a CBC article by saying, and I quote here, I strongly believe that the successful candidate for this role, because of the importance to our success, should be located in our community and be part of our community, end quote. So, Ian, this begs the question, should there be a requirement for city officials to live in the community that they work? To me, Chris, this is a matter of degrees. Like according to the Charter, of course, you can't. I can't tell you where to live in this country. If you decide to live in the town in which you work because you happen to work for the town, great. But if you don't, that's the way it works. Sometimes a council will incentivize somebody to move to a community, community but they can't really penalize them for not. And I get it. Uh, we see that with CAOs sometimes where a lot of times they will live in community and sometimes they won't. They'll choose not to for whatever reason. And there's advantages and disadvantages to both. And the advantages being, of course, you're subject as a CAO to the laws that you're uh, administration helps council consider. And the other part is, if you don't live in town, then you are completely independent of that and can make unbiased, potentially unbiased decisions. But if you look at this, this is kind of taking it to the extreme. The reference being that this town, uh, the city of Sudbury in Ontario, is hiring somebody from southern Alberta to be their CFO. Maybe there was an expectation that uh, she might relocate and that never came to pass for whatever reason it might be. But there's not a lot of direct flights between Southern Ontario and Sudbury. So even if she wants to go back and forth regularly, it's quite difficult for her to do. Throw into this what we saw through the pandemic, too, with remote work, where a lot of office staff could work at home as long as they had good broadband and uh, attended meetings from time to time and knew how to use Zoom and Teams and things. This takes it a bit far by saying, sure, I can work from home, but home in this case is three provinces away. And for somebody who's a senior executive within a municipality not to live in certainly in close proximity to that municipality is something that doesn't seem to strike me as a, as a really good idea either. So while it's a matter of degrees and living in the city isn't mandatory, I suspect that living three provinces away isn't something that's really, really good uh, idea either. You've got a good hire, hopefully, and if you haven't been able to convince that person to move closer uh, through some sort of an incentive, then maybe that says something in and, of, in and of itself as well. I think this might happen more and more. In fact, I have heard stories like this one, not to the same extreme, of people who uh, who don't who live in one place and work in another telecommute and maybe a couple of three days a month commute uh, commute uh, for real as well. So it's going to happen more and more. And for some jobs, it probably doesn't matter. But for a job like this or CAO, any of the, the C-suite equivalent people, I think it's pretty important that they live within driving distance or commuting distance of the place they work anyway. So Ian, as this is our last episode of 2022, we wanted to take a moment and look back on some of the stories we talked about earlier this year, but also give a quick update. In an earlier episode, we talked about how the city of Chestermere in Alberta was under an inspection by the province of Alberta. Now, right. they have responded to the investigation in a lengthy letter, In and I'm quoting to the letter, the entire process of the investigation is flawed. Ian, do municipalities have the ability to fight back against these types of audits? Or inspections, I should say. Inspections. Sure. Well, this is one of those cases of where you stand depends on where you sit. And in this case, 
the inspection process is laid out in the Municipal Government Act. The appointment of the inspector by the minister on behalf of the minister is laid out. And this particular inspector they use is somebody who is pretty much above reproach. So suggesting that he might be biased or that the minister might be biased, which I understand are two of the concerns, to me aren't something I would take seriously other than maybe somebody grasping at straws. However, um, yes, there is the opportunity for a municipality to respond. My understanding of what's happened in Chestermere is that the inspector has delivered the report to the minister and the draft has also been provided to the to city council. And city council, for reasons of procedural fairness, is provided also the right to respond to any accusations that might be in it. Of course, this isn't public yet, so nobody knows what, what those items that might be in it are. As you have suggested, they have said this, the, uh, the situation or the process was fundamentally flawed. That typically happens um, in a few inspections, ones that we've been involved with as well. Uh, typically, often when the results aren't what the council hoped the results would be. And in this case, a majority of council, uh, I think, are the ones who were opposed to the inspection happening in the first place. So, so the fact that council would respond through a council decision this way isn't particularly surprising. And the other aspect to this is the minister appointed an official administrator to act for council if council is acting, I believe, inappropriately. So it remains to be seen what will actually happen here. But uh, we've in inspections we've done where those municipalities who see what has happened, have changed what has gone on, have moved past that, have become really well functioning again over over the short period of time. Those which push back hard are often the ones that have longer term problems coming back to being a well functioning municipality. And who knows? Nobody see, nobody other than the inspector council and the minister has seen this report in draft form. So we don't know what the recommendations are. We don't know what the ministerial directives are. But they are always aimed at leaving the municipality both compliant with legislation and better off than the inspector found it. So that's my hope for what happens in the city of Chestermere anyway. Our last quick look back story, I wanted to bring our attention back to Regina. In an earlier episode, we talked about how two councillors were bringing a suit against the current city manager of Regina over a budget decision and houselessness. Earlier this month, the council voted unanimously to support the CAO city manager. Ian, this is looking very confusing. If I was an outsider in Regina looking at council going, what's going on here? We have councils angry at city managers. We have a unanimous decision. What? Just t- talk to me plainly here and tell me what's going on. <laughs> uh, uh, Chris, I don't know. Uh, the That's the plain part. The not so plain part is you're right that uh, there was two members of council and a third person, I believe, who launched the suit suggesting that this budget line, the budget amount should have shown up in the draft budget. The rest of city council had disagreed with that and voted, as as you had said, a, a unanimous vote of support for the CAO. However, the two people who were those who are involved in the suit chose recused themselves from the vote. So, of course, I suspect it would have been two votes against if they had participated, but they didn't. Bottom line is it ends up being a a unanimous vote of council. And it seems like it's more of a distraction than anything else, that this is a way to make a point rather than trying to a way to get things done. In some 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 people I've talked to over the last few weeks said just seems like a really big game of gotcha, trying to make somebody look bad or trying to make somebody look good as far as this too. But It is a big distraction to the way good governance ought to work uh, in Canada and beyond as well. This isn't a a very good way to get your way within council. If it's two members of council who disagree with the other 11 members of council, they need to be able to make that point uh, in in council and through a vote. And if the vote goes their way and they're able to persuade people, so be it. If the vote doesn't go their way and they're not able to persuade a majority of their colleagues, so be that too. And away we go. So this is likely to continue in some fashion, but I hope it doesn't continue for very long. We'll be right back with our interview with the chair of the Green Municipal Fund Council, His Worship, Mayor Alan Sousa of St. Laurent, Quebec. That'll be good.
Welcome back. Today we are joined by the chair of the Green Municipal Fund Council, His Worship, Mayor Alan D'Souza of St. Laurent, Quebec. Mayor D'Souza is serving his sixth term as the mayor and has served on the City of Montreal's Executive Committee for over 11 years. He is also the architect of Montreal's sustainable development and environmental policies, taking them from planning to implementation. Mayor D'Souza, Chair D'Souza, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Chris and Ian. Good to be there. So I, I want I want to jump into the very first question because I think a lot of people want to know what the heck is the Green Municipal Fund? Well, let's just say that 20 years ago, uh, the federal government had some foresight and it partnered with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities by endowing the Federation of Canadian Municipalities with $125 million. The objective was to use these monies to help municipalities in all of the environmental issues that face they face, land use, transportation, water, wastewater treatment, uh, soil remediation. And so that was the genesis of the Green Municipal Fund. If we fast forward it to today, um, today the Green Municipal Fund with the other endowments has about $1.6 billion under its management. Uh, these monies come from the federal government and our council uses it to be able to uh, provide either loans or grants to Canadian municipalities from coast to coast to coast uh, to allow them to deal with some of the environmental issues they're facing above and beyond what the initial intent was. And the, right now it covers greenhouse gases. It will cover adaptation to climate change and a whole slew of all of the issues that municipalities face can now be dealt with these funds and we're, we're making a difference. Hmm. If, I, if I may jump into here too, what you, you mentioned that the fund does things slightly different or covers slightly different uh, range of topics or projects now than it used to. Uh, what did it, what are the differences? You mentioned some of them now, was it much narrower in the beginning? It was a bit narrow in the beginning because it was an innovative idea. It's quite a unique idea. It's something uh, in that is, uh, unique in countries. Can we, when we travel across the world and we go to different conferences, other countries are always curious and say, how do you do this? How does it work? Since when does the federal government give money to municipalities? Uh, do they really give you, do they really trust you? Uh, what's your track record? And so we've got something uniquely Canadian uh, that started 22 odd years ago and today actually has built up a solid track record. We've been able to help municipalities in retrofitting housing, um, improve their fleets, uh, remediate soil, uh, helping them on particular projects. And to the extent that we can imagine, uh, over 2.8 million tons of greenhouse gases have been reduced uh, as a result of these efforts. Uh, that's the equivalent of about 840,000 cars that are off the road. Um, you know, th those are examples of what we've helped renovate arenas. We've helped uh, deal with wastewater treatment to find an innovative ways. And what's also interesting is that it's not just big municipalities that get it. We cover big, medium, small, rural municipalities. So everyone who's in a different state of development has a chance to take a kick at the can and benefit from the fund. You mentioned being abroad and being seen as an innovator. Have you seen other countries following or more than just kicking tires and asking questions? Uh, well, I think we've inspired other countries. Now, the people that from those countries, well, either the municipal representative, the mayors, the councillors are going back home again and saying, hey, uh, you know, why can't we do it? And hopefully we've inspired some of them to go along the same way as what we've done. But uh, most recently, when uh, president of FCM, Tanine Rudik, was in the, uh, the climate change conference in Egypt, uh, she was getting a lot of questions about what is quite a unique product in Canada. But I know that from other conferences that I've visited, and we're having the biodiversity conference here in Montreal as we speak, um, delegates from all over the world are keenly interested. They're facing similar problems, but in different circumstances. And so they're looking for solutions. And if this is 
one of the solutions, well, so be it. We hope uh, that the models that we've developed can serve other communities, other countries as well. And in that respect, I think, uh, you know, Canada can take a good pat on its back uh, because other governments, successive governments, have followed through on it. It wasn't a one-shot deal with one government of a particular political stripe. No, future uh, administrations have followed. And most recently, uh, we've had good news about a week ago. Uh, we've noticed that uh, there's more money that will be coming to help Canadians deal with adaptation to climate change. Hmm. You mentioned depth and breadth, and both of them growing. Uh, are you seeing more of the applications come from regions or part set groups of municipalities rather than individual municipalities? Yep, because uh, we see the impact of leveraging. We see the impact where a municipality does it. But believe me, when these projects succeed, no one keeps hides their light under a bushel. They proclaim it to the world. They're proud of it. Their community is proud of it. Their leaders are proud of it. And so if those municipalities are active in their region, word of mouth gets about uh, people say, hey, why can't I do it? You got that money, maybe I should apply. And as a result of that, we see it not necessarily in a competitive sense, but in a very strong community building sense that other municipalities get on board. That being said, I don't think any community is averse of what's happening in the world on, on a lot of the environmental issues and on climate change. Uh, not a day goes by before you have stuff in the paper. So from reading about it in the paper and knowing that you want to do something uh, to be part of the solution, not part of the problem, right. often municipalities do that and get involved because, but the, sometimes it comes with a slow step first. Uh, you can't run before you can walk. And in a similar manner, municipalities have to learn success is contagious. And you know we try to make sure that their first steps are successful once they get there, they say, hey, we can do more. And in that sense, the, G the Green Municipal Fund uh, plays an important role in moving people up the value chain. Are you saying, or do you even subscribe to dealing with the results of climate change? I'm thinking about flood mitigation or uh, those sorts of things as well. Do you get involved with that sort of thing? Well, most definitely. Uh, clearly, um, the different municipalities across the country are faced with many of the natural uh, impacts of weather, climate change and weather, extreme weather that we're seeing. So a lot of them have been involved in dealing with their assets that they manage. Uh, and these assets are often put at risk through sure. extreme uh, weather patterns, through heavy rainfalls, through things that we've seen in our newspapers day in, day out. So yes, uh, we are trying to help them understand that, but there's also an effort that has been made by municipalities to reduce their own greenhouse gas emissions. But even after you reduce your own greenhouse gas emissions, we're at a stage where we're still seeing those impacts. And so today, municipalities have to adapt. They have to make sure that regardless of how and when they reduce greenhouse gases in their own communities, weather patterns may still have an impact on them. And so that's why we were thrilled with the national adaptation strategy announced by the federal government last month, that there was a, co a component of $530 million that will be made available to the Green Municipal Fund to continue on the work uh, to help municipalities factor in these risks, see how they can adapt. And what our hope is to be able to not just develop these new technologies, new practices, but to share it with the wide range of uh, our members, uh, our networks in every province across the country. In so doing, we're de-risking certain uh, events and practices or technology techniques. And we're, once the risk is out of it, we're sharing it with a wide range of other municipalities with the hope that they too can use some of the benefit of, uh, of the projects. I'd like to look at you as chair of the Green Municipal Fund, but also as a local mayor as well, and think about how the impact of what the fund does has an impact on the planning that a local council would do. We do, I don't know, 20 or 30 strategic plans for municipalities over the year, and it's very common now that there is some reference to climate change 
as part of a, a, a goal or several goals within a strategic plan, and therefore some reference to the infrastructure and programming that goes with it. Are you seeing the same sort of thing, like a tie between the work the fund does and the necessary necessity or strategy that a council has set out as well? Yes, I do think we uh, are seeing councils being much more aware about it. We're seeing lonely champions on councils having much more company on their council. People are beginning to realize that above and beyond the environment, this is also economic, this right. is social, this is community-based. So it's not something that it's an environmental issue, but clearly if it costs you big dollars because your wastewater treatment has been overwhelmed or uh, if it costs you big dollars for whatever the project might be, uh, then it comes down to the bottom line, it affects people's taxes. And as a result, you have to manage those taxes. So local councils are cognizant of that. They realize that if they preclude any thought of climate change, if they preclude any uh, uh, thought of dealing with the environmental issues in their communities, it's going to come back and bite and bite them big time. Right. And no one, no politician wants to be bitten big time, and you know where. <laughs> so I, I think we're seeing people now begin to lead the parade. And when you lead a parade, you have to look back from time to time to check that people right. are following. You can't do it on your own. You have to build a political consensus for it. You know, these are issues that need to have broad community support sure. from a time when there was a lone voice on council advocating environmental protection. Those days are gone. Right now, you're seeing a much, a lot more of a cohesive council approach to it. But council, too, has to be able to explain it to the community, sure. explain to citizens why we are spending this money, uh, how if we don't spend this money, how much it might cost us. And that degree of political consensus building is important because when at the end of the day, it comes down to dollars and cents. If your budget is going to be impacted by climate change, by environmental concerns, then you're better off spending the money before rather than later. But if you don't have your community behind you, if you're leading a parade where you're the only person in the parade, well, I got news for you. You're going to be flushed at the next election. So you need to be able to bring your community with you to let them know this is why we're doing it. And this is why by being proactive, we're going to save you not just the money, but we're also going to be able to help preserve the quality of life that we have in our community. This is our very last episode of 2022, and we're going to be heading into 2023. So for you, what does 2023 have in store for the Green Municipal Fund Council? I think we're going to see some amazing work. Um, we're already, the, uh, the base has been set, and we're seeing communities across the country expressing the interest. We're seeing it in fleet renewal and electrical uh, fleet uh, networks in the Kootenays. We're seeing it in Vancouver's uh, fire stations that are built to the house of passive house accreditation. We're seeing local energy uh, retrofits happening in sustainable housing. Uh, and these are examples that are percolating across the country and actually happening. The Green Municipal Fund has been very active with the big cities to make sure that the big cities can lead the way, but there's also the medium, small, the rural communities that have to be also encouraged, nourished, and supported. And we're seeing these type of projects come to the forefront. Um, we will also be seeing uh, work being done on adaptation. How do we deal with uh, the impacts of extreme weather and climate change? What are the type of strategies that are gonna be useful to us? And it might vary from coast to coast. What works in Surrey, BC might not be the best uh, way of dealing with it in Prince Edward Island. Um, what works in extreme flooding in Montreal might not be the same type of flooding that you would have elsewhere in Winnipeg. So these are the pieces that would have to be pieced together. And I think these projects are like very topical. They're happening now. They're happening as we speak, we see it. And so municipalities have always been good leaders because they try to get ahead of the curve. Municipal leaders are not people who sit back and let the action come to them or get sandbagged by something that they would rather not be have happened. So they are thinking ahead of the curve. And that's what we're, we're going to be doing with them is saying, how can you identify the risks that face your communities? If that's the, what you're facing, how can you mitigate those risks? 
What are the solutions you have on your table? How does it work in partnering with your fellow municipalities who live in the area? Are there some costs and infrastructure that could be shared? Uh, and those type of questions are being asked as we speak. Clearly, I will say that economic conditions will, ha will have an impact. Um, and that will either wax or wane over time because that's normal. In tough times, some projects get harder to get off the table. In good times, people are willing to uh, spend the extra money and we're going to roll with the punches. So I think 2023 is going to be an exciting year. The fund we is going to be at close to uh, $2.2 billion, no small potatoes. And those monies are going to go into communities across the country. So I think that's the exciting part. And we, I will be doing my best to take that message out to uh, uh, every community who wants to hear about it. But I'm not alone. We've got mayors and councillors who are part of fed the Federation of Canadian Municipalities who are already great ambassadors for us. They take it. Why do they take it? to their communities because there's money in it. There's opportunities in there. There's a chance to look good. There's a chance to protect their communities. So in terms of fiduciary responsibility, they're ahead of the curve. They're not greenwashing. They're actually doing concrete projects that make a huge difference. And so that's why above and beyond what we can do as a council, the fact that we've got a great network across the country with great ambassadors, leads me to believe that uh, 2023 is going to be a very busy year for us. Well, I can't wait to see what 2023 has in store for yourself, but also the Green Municipal Fund. But Mayor D'Souza, I want to uh, take a moment and uh, extend a personal thanks from myself and Ian for you joining us today, for sitting down, talking about your role as chair, but also the Green Municipal Fund Council. And like I said, we look forward to seeing what is in store for 2023 for you and the Green Municipal Fund. So thank you so much. Thanks. And let me thank you and thank all of your listeners. But let me also uh, extend a hand and let's do this again, because I'm sure <laughs> if we're talking about this a year from now, uh, there would be so much new stuff that will probably blow you, blow your socks off. Thanks, Mayor. Thank, Thank you. you. So, Ian. E is for environment. We just had an amazing conversation with the chair of the Green Municipal Fund Council, Mayor Alan D'Souza. We talked about some uh, interesting stories that are happening in Ontario here in Alberta, but some catch up. Um, another great episode. Yeah, wasn't that a lot of fun? He's a fun guy to talk to, uh, Mayor D'Souza. I really enjoyed that too. Yeah. And the uh, issues we've been talking about are a bit of a thread that has run through the last few episodes too. As we move into next year, it'll be kind of interesting to follow them. Uh, hopefully to their conclusion. Exactly. So um, like uh, uh, Ian just said, this is our last episode of 2022, everyone. So uh, in two weeks time, it's Christmas. So we won't be recording, but in January, we will be back with another great episode of The Political Trenches. During that time, share this episode with your friends, share it with your family members, share it on social media, tag us while you share it as well. Uh, send us emails if you like what you're hearing. Give us some feedback on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts. Rate us. We would be highly recommended. Highly appreciative as well. Um, so, And if you want to email us, uh, the email's in the show notes as well. So highly recommend that you do that if you have a story you want us to talk about or even dissect a little bit we might be able to do that for a future episode so ian with that for 2022 thank you so much this has been a fun five episodes so far i look forward to seeing what's in store for 2023 i've enjoyed it too chris i'm looking forward to next year as well merry christmas and happy new year to everybody happy new years as well so with that this has been the political trenches local government at work we will be back in 2023 everyone